But there was a song that came out many years ago entitled, Don't Worry, Amen. Don't Worry, Be Happy. And in this song, the singer, you know, he lists all the problems that he has. He's got no money, he's got no job, you know, but he ends up each problem with the chorus, Don't Worry, Be Happy. The singer, by the way, some people say, who sang that? Bobby McFerrin. Bobby McFerrin. It's funny, he says, landlord, say your rent is late, he may have to litigate. Don't worry, be happy. Well, you know, the, the, I, I was thinking of putting a little smiley face up there, but then I thought better of it. You know, it's easy for Bobby McFerrin to sing Don't Worry, Be Happy because he made two million dollars with this little ditty that lasts about a minute, so he doesn't have to worry anymore about money. But despite the cheerful lyrics, let's face it, we worry, don't we? We do worry. We worry about all kinds of things. We worry about big things like relationships. We worry about those. Certainly our relationship with God, am I okay with God? One of the things that people always ask when they're very, very sick, am I okay with you, God, you know, preacher man? Am I okay with God? Somehow is this illness having to do something with me not being okay with God? People worry about that. Or they worry about a relationship, of course, with other people, with their spouse or children, so on and so forth. Uh, having a safe place to live. It seems in our country there is no safe place anymore. If little children can be just mowed down in a, in a kindergarten, you know, schools used to be the safest place. So there is no safe place. We worry about health, our health. Will we be able to afford health care? We worry about that. Making enough money to take care of our needs. Those are the big things, the little things we worry about. Having a good hair day when it counts, <laughs> right? Will our team win the bowl game? Of course, that doesn't refer to anybody in Oklahoma, but how will I pay this speeding ticket? The second one I've gotten in the last three months. I'm not talking about myself, of course. Marty, maybe, but not me. <laughs> so if we had to list all the big and little things that we worry about, it would be a long list. So a little song that just says, don't worry, be happy, may be easy to sing and a lot of fun to think about, but it's not so easy to actually live on a day-to-day -day basis. As a matter of fact, when the song came out, you know, people used to use this as some sort of placebo. Oh, don't worry, be happy, you know, nothing. Don't worry about it, it'll all be okay. You know? On a day-to-day -day basis in real life, we do worry about all kinds of things, and that worry causes us many times to become sick at heart or physically ill, even depressed at times. And so for that reason, I'd like to share some ways to deal with the big and little worries that all of us experience each day, aside from the little song that says, don't worry, be happy. I'm going to borrow just half of that song title in order to share a couple of ways that we can deal with the problems that we worry about in life. Number one, don't worry, be careful. Don't worry, be careful. You know, when we worry, it's a sign that we are concerned about something, and there's nothing wrong with being concerned about things. There's nothing wrong about you know, focused attention. You know, the big exam is coming up. Well, we need to be concerned enough to study for it. The doctor finds a suspicious lump in our throat or somewhere else we should be concerned enough to have the tests done. You know, take care of business if you wish. Don't worry, be careful. Being careful, being concerned becomes dangerous when it just takes over our lives. You know, people who are so stressed out that they can't see the humor in anything anymore. People who overreact to every little thing. People who obsess over relationships or they obsess about their appearance. 
Maybe if I took all of this together, I'd say, you know, drama? Some people have drama in their lives and other people create drama because they like to live in drama. Jesus warns us that we need to be careful not to let worry about our problems actually take over our lives. The worry about our problems becomes greater than our actual problems. In Matthew 13, 22, a longer passage of course, but the, the nexus of the passage is when he says, when he talks about uh, the, the sower and the seed, and he says, this is the man who hears the word and the worry of the world chokes the word and it becomes unfruitful. He's talking about a believer where the worry has taken over not only his life and his concern, but the worry that he feels has also taken over his spiritual life and made him ineffective. And so the point is that worry can blind us to God's love and God's direction for our life, God's encouragement from His word. You know, that it chokes out the word means that the word speaking to you about your worry has no effect on you anymore, no comfort anymore. You find no direction in the word anymore because this worry is all consuming. You're not listening, you're not hearing him. So don't worry, be careful, be concerned. That's good, that's healthy, that's constructive. And be careful that worry doesn't only ruin our lives here, but also blind us to the life that God offers us through Jesus Christ. You, know, you get that attitude, yeah, yeah, religion later. To talk to me about the Bible later. I, I'm, I'm focused on, I'm worried about this over here. We'll have plenty of time to talk about that Bible stuff later, but it's that Bible stuff that is going to truly help you deal with that other stuff that's taking place in your life. So, don't worry, be careful. Secondly, don't worry, be content. Don't worry, be content. You know, much of our worry is focused on what we don't have. Much of our worry is focused on what might happen in the future in five seconds from now, five days from now, five years from now. Much of our worry has to do with what could have been, what we think ought to have happened, what we did wrong in the past. In other words, we worry about things and events that we have absolutely no control over, absolutely none. In addition to this, we also worry that we're not doing as well as so-and-so, or we're not as smart or good-looking as we think we ought to be. This coming from a bald guy. <laughs> this type of worry usually poisons any opportunity that we may have to worry. Don't you see how Satan works? He might not be able to seduce you into you know, robbing a bank, cheating on your spouse. He might not be able to seduce you into those soul-killing activities. But he can take the rub off your happiness. He can take the shine off of your joy. He can rob you of the ability to uh, enjoy and appreciate and savor the good things that God has given you. He hasn't won your soul because you believe and you're faithful, but He'll do the next best thing. He'll ruin, He'll try to ruin whatever good God has given you. What's the antidote to this type of poisonous worry? Well, the antidote is seeking contentment, here's the secret, with what you have, not with what you don't have. In Philippians chapter four, I'll give you a chance to get there if you'd like. In Philippians chapter four, verse 11, Paul talks about this 
And one of the very rare things that you find in scripture, especially among the apostles, is when they make personal references to themselves. You know what I'm saying? They're talking about themselves. Because you know, we don't really know what they look like and what they sounded like and so on and so forth. So it, it's not very often they're talking about their own spiritual struggles. But here in Philippians 4, Paul talks about a very personal experience. He says, uh, 4.11, he says, I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. Notice he says, he didn't say, I am content. He says, I have learned. It's a learned thing. I have learned to be content. You're not sure about content? Okay, take the word content out, put the word satisfied. Does that work better for you? I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. And then he says, I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. And I would dare say you could take the word strengthen out and put the word teaches me. Because where do you think you learn the things that you need to know in order to be content the way Paul? Well, you learn it from Christ, not from the world. Paul focused on what he had whatever that was, and he learned to be content with that. So when his ministry was going great and he had plenty of help, he had helpers, things were, people were being baptized, churches were, you know, uh, the spirit was working powerfully in his life, uh, there was a harvest. A lot of times, you know, your ministry is just a lot of seed sowing, you don't see a lot of harvest, you know. But he saw harvest. And he was content with his success at that moment. And then when he was in jail, abandoned by many of his previous co-workers, he accepted and made the best of that condition. And his ability was not that he didn't care, I don't care I'm in jail, no. He fought to be free. He demanded to go before Caesar to plead his case. It's not that he, he was fatalistic, whatever, whatever. That wasn't his attitude. And it's not that a change of circumstances didn't affect him. I'm sure sleeping in a comfortable bed in, in, in a brother or sister's uh, uh, home, brother or sister in the Lord's home, was a lot better than the stinking jail he was in uh, uh, chained. So it's not like he wasn't human, he didn't feel the dampness and the cold and the lousy food and the darkness. And so it's not that that didn't affect him physically. He cared all right, he wanted to get out of that. Now his secret to being content in every circumstance, and you need to listen here please, was that he drew his contentment from his relationship with Christ and not his relationship with his circumstances. And that's worth repeating. Paul's secret to being content in every circumstance was that he drew his contentment from his relationship with Christ, not his relationship with the circumstances. He wasn't on a roller coaster. Sometimes it's good and I'm happy and sometimes it's bad and I'm not happy. And sometimes it's good and I'm content and sometimes it's happy and I'm not content. Here's the bad one. And sometimes it's good and I'm not content. I'm still not content. But he learned early on to base his contentment and satisfaction, his cup of living, to base that on his relationship with Jesus Christ where there is no up or down or up or down. His relationship with Christ is steady. Why? Because Christ is steady. The one who says, I'm the same yesterday, today, tomorrow, you know, he's steady. No up and down with him. So things change and circumstances change and you change but Jesus Christ is the same today and yesterday and tomorrow. 
And when your contentment is based on Him, you can be at peace in any kind of circumstance. I didn't say comfortable. There's nothing comfortable about having the flu, for example. There's nothing comfortable about having cancer. There's nothing comfortable about being poor or losing your job or having to lose your home or whatever. There's nothing, quote, comfortable about that. But we're not talking about comfort. We're talking about contentment, which is a spiritual thing. Which brings me to my third point. Don't worry, be careful. Don't worry, be content. Don't worry, be Christ-centered. Jesus Himself devoted a long segment of teaching specifically on this topic of worry. So let's go and let's read anew a very familiar passage, Matthew chapter 6. Again, I'll give you a chance to get there, Matthew chapter 6. Now the interesting thing about this passage and the fact that he was saying this to first century people in and around Jerusalem, in and around Galilee, that small country at the, in the first century, isn't it amazing? Human nature hasn't changed. We're using this passage to deal with issues of stress and worry in the year 2013, but the passage was spoken to people who lived 2,000 plus years ago. It must mean that those people there who were fishermen and bakers and farmers or whatever they were, had the same concerns because we're using the exact same words to deal with our concerns today in 2013. So what does he say? Let's begin just in, we can't read the whole chapter, let's start down in verse 25. Again, such a familiar passage, but like cool water. This is like drinking a cold glass of water. He says, for this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds in the air, that they do not sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon, in all of his glory, clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will He not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Do not worry then, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first His kingdom, and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And so in this passage, Jesus mentions several things about worry. Let's kind of list them, shall we? First thing He says, worrying is futile. God knows what you need, and if He cares for the flowers and the birds, it will surely, or He will surely care for you. There's the, you know, the example He gives. Worry adds nothing to this truth. Second thing He says, worry is a sign of disbelief. Jesus says that a mark of the unbeliever's lifestyle is worry over the necessities of life. I mean, he says, like the, don't do like the Gentiles, they worry. And what was it about the Gentiles? Well, they didn't believe. Believers know better than to worry about such things. That's why it's so sad when we allow Satan to undermine our faith with this particular strategy. Should we be concerned? 
Absolutely. Don't worry, be concerned, be careful. But worry, no. We shouldn't worry. He also says that worry distorts your view of life. Worry brings a person to focus on the future or the past instead of the present. Each day has its own challenges and God provides what we need to meet these daily challenges. So what does He say? Do not waste your resources by focusing them on tomorrow. Stick to solving today's problems. Tomorrow we'll have another set of problems and tomorrow God will provide the resources that you will need to face tomorrow's problems. But what do we do? We take the resources that we've been given today, spiritual and emotional and even physical resources, and we invest them into worrying about tomorrow. Or worse still, we waste them by worrying about the past. So what happens? Well, the resources that we have enough for today have been squandered by worrying about tomorrow or regretting the past, leaving us deficient in dealing with the problems of today. And that's what Jesus is saying. You get one day's worth of enough stuff to take care of today. And He's saying, so take care of today. Tomorrow I'll provide what you need to take care of tomorrow. Jesus also provides us with the way to order our priorities so that no matter what happens, we're not carried away by excessive worry <clears throat> or anything else for that matter. He says, you know, the best way to combat worry? Prioritize, prioritize. You know, you've got a busy day, you've got a million things to do, you've got schedules, you've got appointments, you've got stuff, your agenda's jam-packed, you don't know how you're going to get through the day, you start worrying about it and sweating. I don't know about you, but what I do when that happens, when there's too much, I start prioritizing. What absolutely needs to happen today? Number one, what's the priority that I need to get done today? And I start there and work my way down. Jesus says, here's your priority. Put the kingdom first. Every day, put the kingdom first. And I'll, I've mentioned this to you many, many, many years ago. You need sometimes some physical things to help you remember things. You know what I'm saying? It's a spiritual concept, but sometimes you need a physical way to remind yourself of that. And I'll, if Paul can share a little, I can share a little. The way that I do that is the very first thing that I do when my feet you know, swing out of the bed and land on the floor. I don't know about you guys, maybe you guys just jump out of bed running, but I tend to sit on the side of the bed for a minute, take my pulse. Okay, it's going to be a good day. The very first thing that I do the moment my feet touch the floor is to offer a prayer to God. It's not my prayer time, it's not my quiet time, that's later on in the evening. But it's the very first thing that I do. Good morning, Lord. And I wait to think about who can I pray for today? Who's hurting? Who's, who has needs? What have I heard? It never takes more than 30 seconds. It's like a reset. The minute my feet touch the floor for the first time that day, my prayer begins to go up to God. That's my little way of trying to keep the kingdom as a priority. If the first thought that I have in the new day is about God and my relationship with Him, there might be a good, a good chance, if you wish, the odds will be that hopefully I'll be able to keep that priority going throughout the rest of the day, because you never know what happens after that. And so Jesus says the kingdom first. In other words, make Jesus and doing His will in your lives the number one priority and you will automatically worry less about the future because Jesus is the Lord of the future and guarantees that no matter what happens, we have an eternal future with Him. And you will worry less about the past 
because His blood has covered the past and has wiped away every failure, every mistake, and every sin, Jesus protects us from being haunted by the past. I have some good things in my past, as so do you, but I also have some nasty things in my past, and I would suspect you do as well. But those things in the past do not haunt me. They teach me, they teach me, but they don't haunt me anymore. And putting Christ first will also guarantee that everything we need to do His will, intent, to deal with the problems, He will provide. Why would He say that He would do that if He wasn't planning to do that? A Christ-centered life eliminates the things that cause us to worry. When Jesus is first, we are saved from the past. We are safe today and we are guaranteed eternal salvation in the future. Where's the worry in all of this? So I hope that you'll truly take these lessons that you have been given today and Marty's lesson, sermon, and in the classes and so on and so forth, and take them to heart about reverence and fervency in worship, about service and how that should be a byword of our daily existence as Christians, about replacing you know, worry with contentment and carefulness and Christ-centeredness. I hope you'll take all of this into your hearts because these are the things and ideas that will truly bless you. Excessive worry contributes greatly to physical and emotional illness that many of us suffer from. I'm not saying that there won't be things in your life that will cause you concern and heartache, but if you work at being careful and content in a Christ-centered lifestyle, then worry will not control you and worry will not lead you to disbelief and discouragement. So if you're worried tonight that you're not right with God, that don't worry, be concerned, pay attention. If you have not yet confessed His name and been immersed in the waters of baptism for the remission of your sins, be concerned about that, but do something about it. You can, the opportunity is here. And if you're worried that your life is not right and you're not living as a Christian should live the way you know you should live, well then be concerned about it. Do something about that. You can take care of that tonight. Offer God a prayer. Let the elders pray for you. Be restored to a good relationship with your Lord. And if you're simply worried because of illness and family issues and so on and so forth, then cast that worry upon God in prayer by letting us pray for you this evening and show you our support. Whatever your need, don't worry. God loves you and He wants to help you today, only if you will let Him. If you need to respond to our invitation tonight, then we encourage you to come forward now as we stand and Bobby leads us in our song of invitation.